Enero. Welcome to Powering Aviation, where CNBC TV 18 in association with GE gets together top stakeholders in the aviation sector. And today we are going to discuss technology trends in civil aviation. By 2050, the United Nations estimates that two thirds of the global population will be living in cities, and mobility will play a crucial role in the socio economic fabric of the future. Now, it is abundantly clear that uh, innovation and technology uh, in the areas of material science, uh, alternate fuels, uh, as well as IoT devices, that will drive and disrupt uh, the aviation ecosystem. And to discuss uh, these future trends, we are now being joined by Bala Bharatwaj, who is the former MD of, uh, of uh, Boeing India Engineering and Technology Center. We also have with us uh, Saurav Sinha, who is the Chief Information Officer of uh, Indigo, uh, joining us uh, from uh, Chennai is uh, Professor Satyanarayan Chakravarti, who is a professor in IIT Madras, and Vikram Reddy, who is uh, the general manager of GE Aviation. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, let me straight away go to Professor Chakravarti. Sir, uh, let me start by asking you about the uh, future uh, technology ecosystem that we are going to see. Uh, we understand that uh, many of these prototypes and new ideas related to the civil aviation sector, they are in the drawing boards now across different uh, R&D labs uh, across the world. But uh, we will see commercial production of many of these uh, uh, prototypes and systems uh, in the near future. Can you give us a short snapshot of what to expect in terms of new technology related innovations in the civil aviation space? Thanks for asking this very important question to start with, right? So one thing we have to actually understand is technology is meant for uh, implementation on the ground. So what technology we have to be really worried about is what's going to be pertinent to aviation. And in that respect, we have to actually look at this as a uh, change with continuity. So in the last 10 years, what we have seen is moving away, maybe more than more than 10 years, in fact, moving away from a hub and spoke system that people, people used to follow where there were like very big hubs in airports uh, in major cities and then everybody will have to actually go to the hub and then go to another hub and then go from there and stuff. That was, that, that was the original plan. And uh, uh, you know, the larger and larger aircraft were actually being uh, catered to by these, these large hubs. We are moving away from that. Let's say for example, the Boeing uh, uh, Dreamliner kind of tried to disrupt that by having smaller aircraft that can go longer range. And that changed things a bit. And people are now trying to actually do lots of, you know, uh, hinterland travel directly from point to point, right? So for example, going from Hyderabad to uh, Birmingham, right? So, so something like that, um, rather than having to go from Hyderabad to Delhi or Bombay, and then from that to London, and then from that to Birmingham, right? So this is changing things. So what it essentially means is that we will go in the direction of longer range, smaller aircraft with smaller airports, airports that are distributed further and further. Uh, Bala, you know, you have been uh, associated with a company uh, like Boeing uh, for, for uh, over 33 years. Uh, and you also headed uh, uh, a very important, uh, you know, uh, Boeing related institution in India. Um, my question to you is, uh, what do these technology related uh, changes uh, uh, they mean uh, for for OEMs uh, like uh, uh, Boeing or or Airbus. The technologies eventually have to get onto the airplane, uh, so I mean that is what the OEM would be looking for. And uh, you know some of the things that uh, Professor Chakravarti mentioned, uh, for example, about using hydrogen as a fuel. You know, 3D printing. We also refer to it as additive manufacturing. These have been, these kinds of technologies have been in the works for a very long time. Uh, you know, going back to almost uh, 20 years. Uh, now, they are definitely becoming more mature. And today we have uh, 3D printing, for example, being used in certain parts of the airplane. Uh, we even have 3D printed parts, uh, you know, used in spacecraft today. So the technology has matured. Uh, but they will continue to mature. Uh, and it is not only the engines that will benefit from it, uh, I think the airframe will benefit from it. 
you know, one of the fundamental things when you talk about efficiency of aircraft is, you know, how heavy is this aircraft? And, and uh, the more we are able to, uh, to design structures smartly, uh, we can make the aircraft lighter. If the aircraft becomes lighter, lighter, it requires less fuel to fly it from place to place. So it's kind of a virtuous cycle where a lighter aircraft means less fuel, less fuel means lighter aircraft again. So, you know, it actually, you know, ends up becoming uh, a virtuous cycle where uh, it is uh, one technology or one area of the aircraft is actually helping uh, to improve the other area of the aircraft. Now, uh, let's try to go into some specifics uh, and, and I want to get uh, Vikram into the conversation now. Uh, you know, uh, we have seen that you know reliability, serviceability, and of course, you know we are talking about you know you know even sustainability issues. They are extremely crucial for uh, the aviation uh, sector. Now, as new innovations uh, uh, they get online and and uh, companies start using it, uh, uh, by how much can companies squeeze in uh, more revenue per aircraft uh, as they get used to this new technology paradigm, uh, Vikram? So, uh, I think the other panelists uh, brought out the challenges of the next generation technologies very well. Uh, if you look at the future, uh, a sustainable uh, planet and aviation contribution into it, there are certain things that fall out, right? So, we would like the technology to provide uh, lesser fuel consumption. We would like the technology to build in lesser emissions, more quieter aircraft. So, these are all the aspects that we as an engine company have big role to play in uh, contributing. So if you look at uh, the journey of the engine development, this is not new. The LEAP engine that got introduced is better than its predecessor by 15% in fuel burn. Uh, the next generation of aircraft will be better over LEAP by at least 20%. That's what we uh, think it would be. And uh, there are technologies that would uh, get us there and they need to be matured like Dr. Bala was saying, so they would need their cycle time to mature, but there are some exciting technologies that uh, we are investing. Uh, a couple of them that I could point out is, um, one is the materials, you know, as you like to get more fuel, um, better fuel burn from the engines, uh, you would, uh, the physics wants you to run the engine hotter. And that means you need newer materials that can withstand these high temperatures that happen uh, inside the engine. So the materials like ceramic matrix composites, for example, is a big innovation that is going on. They, they give you one third of, uh, come at one third of the weight of current materials, but can take another 500 degree foreign heat more. So there is uh, a technology out there. Uh, uh, Professor Chakravarti talked about 3D printing it's a huge uh, technology for us to take um, take this technology, be able to develop complex designs, but not increase the cost. Uh, so our catalyst engine that we're working today, for example, has um, converted 855 parts into 16 parts, just because we are able to integrate parts together and print complex parts. The journey will continue and it will play a big role in uh, in future as well. Right, Vikram, uh, I want to ask you one more question uh, very quickly. Uh, we understand that you know, uh, you know, uh, GE has a largest R and D lab outside US uh, in India, and we understand that uh, you know this lab is also working on a lot of these technologies. So, very quickly, give us some overview on what to expect from uh, from uh, the the G uh, GE facility in India as far as R and D is concerned. So GE uh, India has been a very integral part of uh, GE's story of innovation and we have uh, a campus there where we invested 200 million, it has 4,500 people, 1,000 of them are for aviation uh, uh, engineering here. So uh, just as a foundation, the uh, most recent product that we developed, GE 9X program, a significant portion of that engine development happened out of India. And this is a record-breaking engine uh, with respect to its thrust. So we're very, very uh, proud and established a very solid foundation of developing uh, the innovation and product development of the jet engines right from here in India in collaboration with all the global engineering locations we have. Uh, Mr. Sina, uh, 
what does these developments mean in terms of uh, fleet management, route management, uh, and passenger experience? Uh, will companies uh, like you know Indigo uh, will they have to change their business model uh, to incorporate many of these technology-related developments that we are going to see uh, in the, in the near future? Uh, let me first describe you know what what the business of airline is all about, um, and uh, the airlines across the world are. Uh, have become successful only if they would have managed their cost structure very well. And, and that's, the, that's the central mantra. Uh, yes, revenue is there. We, one has to really increase uh, and improve on the revenues uh, on a regular basis. Uh, uh, but at the same time, the most important for us uh, is the cost structure because we operate at very, very thin margins. So obviously fuel, and that's what uh, both Dr. Bala as well as Vikram and Professor Chakravarti mentioned about it. So fuel constitutes about 35% of any airline cost. And that is substantial. And that is something where we have really no control in terms of the price of the fuel, which is driven by the international markets. Uh, so obviously efficiencies, weight, and all this stuff actually plays a very, very important role for any airline and also for Indigo, obviously. Now, when I say about... Uh, uh, about uh, fuel efficiency, the engines. As a matter of fact, what we have done in the recent past, uh, we we had taken efficient engines from from Pratt and Whitney. Although, as uh, I think Dr. Bala was mentioning, you know, new technologies always have a challenge. Uh, yes, it did pose a challenge for Indigo uh, over a period of eight to twelve months, where we had some performance issues with all these engines. But we have been able to replace them. We have been able to fix them with the help of the OEMs. Now, uh, we are again getting into another new engine type, which is from GEC FM56 engines, so which you call LEAP engines. And uh, these have just started coming in. The new deliveries uh, of our aircrafts are coming in with those engines. And these are engines which will give me a savings to the tune of about 15 to 20% in fuel. And obviously, the cost has to be managed uh, uh, in, in a much more efficient way, and uh, as I as uh, as I would say that uh, fuel is one part of it, and secondly is the the weight overall weight of the aircraft uh, in terms of which determines also the 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 amount of fuel that an aircraft will consume over a particular particular route. Now, yes, we have gone in for all the new generation aircrafts, uh, A320 Neos, A321 Neos. We are retiring the old uh, aircrafts, giving it back. Uh, uh, and uh, what we would have in the fleet, uh, we would have a very, very young fleet actually going forward. On that note, we'll take a short break. You are watching Powering Aviation. Welcome back. You are watching Powering Aviation, where CNBC TV 18 in association with GE gets together top stakeholders in the civil aviation sector. I want, I want to get Bala uh, again into the conversation. Uh, you know, one byproduct of these technological innovations that we have discussed so far uh, would be, you know, uh, the the em em emergence of, uh, you know, aggregators in the, in the civil aviation space. Now, when that happens, uh, uh, what shape could such new entrants take and uh, how should uh, uh, airline companies uh, adopt strategies to take care of uh, disruption of uh, business models because of uh, aggregators in the civil aviation space? Yeah, be before I go there, uh, I think when you say aggregators, you're talking about companies like a, an Uber or an Ola. Uh, that is more a matter of how you provide service to the passenger. Now, you know, the aggregator you know, is providing a certain convenience factor. But at the end of the day, you know, whoever is running it, like if it's a Uber, you know, there are people who are driving the car, they have to maintain the car, uh, whatever revenue they generate through the aggregator still has to make sense to them. So I think that would still continue from an airline perspective. Uh, the airline could actually get additional passengers because the aggregator may provide another stream uh, where the airline can now, uh, you know, source passengers, so to speak. Uh, but I think I want to go back to the, the comment that uh, uh, Saurabh was making. Uh, there are, you know, digital technologies that are being used today to improve the way the airline flies the route, 
to improve how we can maximize the, the fuel efficiency of the existing fleet. Because at the end of the day, you know, when we talk about these long range development of technology, uh, you know, airlines are not the kind, you know, airplanes when we make them, uh, whether it is Boeing or Airbus or anybody else, these don't change, you know, like cell phones, you know, you cannot just go change them every few months. You, it takes a long time to develop them. But then there is the whole layer of given a particular fleet, given a particular aircraft type, how can I maximize the utilization of that aircraft? Uh, and it goes all the way from, you know, is there a particular route that I can use? Uh, you know, what is the weather condition? How do I fly in that particular weather condition? Uh, how do I take advantage of the weather? How do I avoid the situations where uh, it may be adverse impact on the fuel? So there are other aspects of this, and this would not be impacted by how my passengers are, you know, being pointed to the aircraft. Right. Uh, you know, uh, we are uh, going short on time and hence uh, I would want uh, Mr. Chakravarti to answer this uh, you know, very briefly. Uh, my question to you is regarding, you know, supersonic travel. I mean, and we understand that uh, globally, uh, uh, many uh, companies and startups are actually working on this. Uh, and perhaps we would see, you know, P2P supersonic travel uh, in, in, the, in the future, the revival of supersonic sonic travel as far as business travel is concerned. Uh, uh, can you give, uh, give us uh, some insight into this very quickly, uh, Professor Chakravarti? Unless we are able to actually bring down the uh, the fuel consumption, um, we are uh, not going to actually see this have much of attraction, and that's the point of uh, 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 research that we uh, will will have to be doing. Uh, the interesting thing is there has been quite a bit of effort that's been done in hypersonic travel that is even more faster than supersonic. So just to give you a sense of uh, you know what the numbers are we are looking at about mark 2 to 2.2 or so for supersonic travel versus something like a mark 5 or 6 for a hypersonic travel there are significant strides that have been made on things like supersonic combustion and the kind of high temperature materials that are required for hypersonic travel uh, the, the i think the, the the valley that we are actually looking at is in supersonic uh, travel in terms of trying to bring down the fuel consumption i think if you are able to crack that code on uh, fuel consumption for supersonic, I think in the near term, that is quite likely to happen with uh, a few startups that are working on it to the extent I, I know. Uh, as well as I think, in my opinion, we need to probably push for hypersonic travel itself because I think there is, uh, as I said, uh, significant work has been done on supersonic combustion itself, um, plane holding, stabilization, all of that stuff, and, and high temperature materials. So uh, I think the world should be ready for us to start working on uh, hypersonic civil transport. That's what we should be pushing for. Before we end, Saurav, very quickly, can you tell us uh, what do these technological inno in innovations in the civil aviation space uh, mean for the passenger using airports? From a passenger perspective, uh, what does he look for? I mean, let me put it this way. So on the day of the travel, he should be fully informed that if there has been any change in the schedule, any change in the flight um, uh, timings, whatever it is, if there has been a delay, uh, so that's one. Secondly, is that uh, when he's when he's on his way to the airport, uh, and especially business traveler, or for that matter, any other any traveler, he should exactly know whether he will make it on time. I mean, especially the kind of traffic that we see in most of the metro cities today. So, giving him an assessment, giving him an assurance, uh, is something that uh, he would typically look for. That hey, you you know what. Uh, you are still 30 minutes away, uh, you know, but uh, we, we are closing closing the check-in counters where we are closing the gates probably in the next 20 minutes, so you will not make it there. And so we are booking you on an alternate flight. I mean, he doesn't have to come to the airport and then, then, then run between counters and run between the airlines to get a ticket for himself. In that way, the airline also benefits. I mean, he's been able to retain that customer. Otherwise, he, the customer would have gone to a, uh, another competitor. So that's one. When he reaches the airport, I mean, all of us have experienced, uh, you know, the delays and all that stuff. While now, uh, one is that the, the volume, passenger volume is less, uh, but at the same time, it has been a government mandate that all of us should do a web check-in or a mobile check-in. That has reduced the, the kind of crowd which actually used to happen. You used to see, you know, long serpentine queues in front of the check-in counter or in front of the kiosk. But that's not the end of the game. 
They, they, they pe people as a passenger, I would also look forward to, you know, how do I seamlessly go through my security, uh, go into the departure hold area and how seamlessly I can board the aircraft. And that's where, we, as you mentioned, you know, Digi Yatra kind of initiatives will actually come into uh, a, a very good benefit for the, for the customers. On that note, we are completely out of time, but important insights coming into what to expect as far as uh, technology and innovation in the civil aviation sector is concerned. Uh, Bala Bharadwaj, uh, Saurav uh, Sinha, uh, Professor uh, Chakravarti, and uh, Vikram Berry, thank you so much for joining uh, this conversation. You are watching CNBC TV 18.